Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. Who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me It's amazing I am a friend of God I am a friend of God I am a friend of God He calls me friend I am a friend of God I am a friend of God I am a friend of God, He calls me friend. Here we go, God Almighty. Let's sing it. God Almighty, Lord of glory you have called me friend god almighty lord of glory you have called me friend who am i that you are mindful of me that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God, He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God, He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God, He calls me friend. Man, good morning. I'm excited. It's good to see you all here, and uh, I'm excited. Easter's coming in a, in a week. I'm excited. Um, celebrate the, the rising of our Lord and what it means to us. So today we're going to get started a little early and we're going to sing about 
how he brought us back to life. Let's sing. I wandered through the darkness, wasting away. My soul was cold and hopeless, dead in the grave. Like a river of life in a dry land, like a flicker of sight to a blind man, I saw the glorious light as it broke in. God of mercy and might, oh, you brought me back to life. You're the Lord of light, shining in the dark. You're the source of life, beating in my heart. You're the living hope. You're the risen Christ. You restored my soul. Oh, you brought me back to life. The brilliance of your glory awakens my soul. You give me grace and mercy. I give you control. Like a river of life in a dry land. Like a flicker of sight to a blind man. I saw the glorious light as it broke in. God of mercy and might, oh, you brought me back to life. You're the Lord of light, shining in the dark. You're the source of life, beating in my heart. You're the living hope, you're the risen Christ. You restored my soul, oh, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. You are the resurrector, you conquered the grave. You pulled me from the water, free from my chains, and risen to live. Like a river of life in a dry land, like a flicker of sight to a blind man, I saw the glorious light as it broke in god of mercy and might oh you brought me back to life you're the lord of light shining in the dark you're the source of life beating in my heart you're the living hope you're the risen christ you restored my soul oh you brought me back to life you're the lord of light Shining in the dark, you're the source of light, beating in my heart. You're the living hope, you're the risen Christ. You restored my soul, oh, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. Oh, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. Amen. This week I was reminded of um, through a conversation I had with a friend at work through, of the 23rd Psalm. Lord is our shepherd. And uh, the line in there that says, I shall not want, and how hard that is sometimes for us to believe that and receive that. Um, and then I'm, I think, you know, we're going to sing Still Waters and reflect on the 23rd Psalm, but there's a line in here, a promise from Jeremiah, from Chronicles, the New Testament, even you go into James, uh, the beginning of the chorus, Lord, I will seek and I'll find you there. I'll seek you and I'll find you. It's repeated throughout the Bible. James tells us, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. And um, that's a promise that we seek him with our heart. He'll be there. We draw, we come together, he'll be there. And it's a, you know, he said he'll never leave or forsake us. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment and reflect on 
uh, that truth, that reality this morning as we're going through First John. I mean, that's kind of what the whole theme is, that all about drawing near to God and being in fellowship with Him. So let's just take a moment. Um, if you want to sing, sing with me. If you want to reflect with God, uh, feel free. This is your freedom in worship, whatever posture that reflects your heart right now. You need to stand, you need to sit, you need to pray. Now's your time to do that. sufficient one you restore my soul you restore my soul you restore my soul no, Lord I will seek Lord I will seek and I'll find you there take me to still waters where I'll thirst no more, lead me in your righteousness, for your name is higher, and I am yours, Lord, I will see, and I'll find you there, take me to still waters. Where I'll thirst no more, lead me in your righteousness, for your name is higher, and I am yours, for your name is higher, and I am yours, yes, my name is higher. And I hear 
the Savior say, Thy string indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Here we go. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise his life up from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you this morning. We praise you for just who you are, the eternal God, 
There's nothing else that we need to, to praise you, to lift up praise to you, yet you, you give us so much more. We praise you for the resurrection. We look forward to celebrating. We praise you for uh, paying for our, uh, our sin. Father, we praise you for this church that, that we have, this body to come and, and know you and worship you and all the other blessings that we could list. You've given so much to us for, for no reason but that you love us. No merit on our own, nothing that we deserve or, or earned, just your free gift. We lift up your name this morning and, and we, we invite you here. You promise you'll be here when we draw near to you, Father. Draw our hearts near to you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So John takes this gospel, and particularly the upper room, and applies it to, I haven't said much yet, it, it's fine, we'll be fine, um, applies it to the local church. What will this look like if the local church lives it out? Now, let me just throw this out there. Uh, the, the gospel of John, depending on who you ask, written roughly 20 to 30 years, let's say, after this moment. Again, depending on who you ask. And then... The letters of John, written eh, 30, 35 years later, again, depending on who you ask. So we're talking about within lifetimes here. Now, now why is that important? Well, it's important, first of all, but for John's purpose, because he, he says at the very beginning of First John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon or beheld or gazed upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. We have seen it and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and then was revealed to us. And why? So that you may have fellowship with us and that our fellowship might, might be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is saying, I'm writing to you and you've been with me and we've talked about this and I'm telling you about somebody that I myself saw, that I myself was with, and that I beheld him, and I looked at him and touched him. And we were together. I'm, I'm giving you firsthand testimony experience. And when you receive this word from me that I got from him, we all get to have fellowship together around him, the one who gives us life when we believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. But the other reason that is important is because there were, were challenges to this fellowship in Christ, challenges to this life with a capital L, and we, we saw, that, um, we, we saw that, that there was this pulling away, and Alan has emphasized this for a, a couple of weeks, um, but just this idea, trust Jesus, love Jesus, and love one another, John, I think we've seen that a numerous a number of times, and Alan emphasized that two weeks in a row in the passages at the end of First John 3, um, but John says that our loves will become misdirected, and our hearts will get pulled towards the world and towards our own pride, um, but the other challenge was the fact that there were false teachers were already rising up um, from the church, in the church, which if you think about that, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, what do we, let's, let's imagine at most that this letter is coming 35 years later, and you're thinking, there are people still alive at the writing of this letter who were with Jesus, who saw Jesus, who saw him perform miracles, and we already have false prophets, we already have false teachers. I mean, they didn't even have the internet yet, right? They didn't even have YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, or none of that. They didn't have any quick way <laughs> to spread bad teaching. And yet, within the lifetime of these apostles, we already have false teachers. And you say, how in the world does that happen? What well, happened? Because there's always a market, right? <laughs> there's, there's always somebody ready to listen. So where is this coming from, and what are we to do? And that's what we're going to see today in 1 John uh, chapter 4. Where is this coming from? Where is this message coming from? And, and what are we to do about it? And um, we've already seen this a little bit back in 1 John 2, where we were introduced to the word antichrist with a small 
A, where he says there are already antichrists in the world, and they're trying to tell you that Jesus is not the Son of God, and Jesus is not the Christ, and those were the things they were denying. And we're going to see that, that happening again. But I'm going to read through our text. It's First John 4, starting at verse 1, going down to verse 6. And when I say, where is this coming from? I want you to listen for one word, okay, that's going to be repeated, I believe I have highlighted about eight times in these six verses. Why don't you listen for the word from? Okay, let me read this through. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So uh, lots of word from. Where is this coming from? And, and John has been um, very persistent in his drawing up of, of sharp uh, differences and opposites, right? He's talked about truth, and he's talked about error. He's talked about light, and he's talked about darkness, right? He's talked about love, and he's talked about hatred. He's talking about from God and from the devil. And, and today, it's the spirit of God versus the spirit of the world and where these messages come from. Now, beloved, do not believe every spirit, which would lead you to believe that maybe some... Um, People were struggling with this. Maybe some had had believed this. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And we saw this back in chapter 2, that it says they went out from us. So these are people who were part of the church, who were in the church. John likely knew these people. They probably were sharp people. They probably knew a lot of, enough truth uh, to be dangerous with it. It comes from within the church, but he says at the same time, it's the spirit of the world. And they're denying, we saw back in, in chapter 2, we read down through that, um, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out. So in other words, they went out from the church. It started in the church that it might be complained that they were not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. And I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. And no lies of the truth. Who is it? Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And no one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father. So he says, Antichrist, small a, you've heard one is coming. I'm just telling you there are lots of them in the world already. So if you're just kind of waiting for an Antichrist to come one day, you're going to miss it because there are these people who deny the sonship of Jesus, who deny that Jesus is Savior, that he is God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. And so these false prophets uh, are getting an audience, and they're using a lot of the right language. And he says, this you know, the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So it's the same thing he said before. And and there's a little interesting uh, twist here. Um, you confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now, now, what is he saying? Well, a couple of things might be happening here. These false teachers might be denying that the Messiah ever even came, that Jesus was really the Messiah at all, and that they were still looking for a Messiah. And it may have been that there was someone among them who was claiming to be God's Messiah, God's Savior. But it also might even be more specific in that, than that, in that they might have been denying that Jesus even had a physical body that Jesus was some sort of phantom or ghost, right? And, 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 and so, so we saw this earlier 
where if you can just kind of say, well, bodies are bad and spirit is good, and so Jesus probably didn't have a body. So what you do with your body isn't really that important. You can just do anything you want with your body. Those things aren't a big deal. It's just what spiritually happens that's most important, right? And so just even denying that Jesus came in a human body and died a real death and rose again in a body. He says they're denying all that. And it's, it's very interesting how he puts this. Um, when you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, but then he says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. In other words, not only f- did, were they known for what they did say, they were known for what they were not willing to say. And that's very important in that they were not willing to confess, right? If you kept pressing them on Jesus, there were certain things they weren't willing to say about Jesus. So you've heard that this spirit, and it's now in the world already. So here's people who use Bible language, Jesus language, God language, and they come out of the church, and they're speaking these prophecies, and the prophecies are either you're just kind of saying this stuff out there, or they're teaching falsely about Jesus. Um, I saw this twice this week, and, and we, we tend to think that this sort of thing comes from one certain place, but I saw it come from two different directions this week. Um, first of all, one of them came from a, a, a friend that I've known since fifth grade. Um, Miss Gartrell's fifth grade class at Norwood Elementary. Um, none of you have been there. It's in Knoxville. But anyway, um, and sat beside him in homeroom my senior year of high school. And here's a guy who's been uh, a pastor, been in ministry, and he posted this little thing on Facebook, and, and he said this, well, if God is love, then he must approve of every human union that is loving. So if if two people say they love each other, then it doesn't really matter who they are, what they are. Uh, It's love, right? And God's love, right? And so he must approve of of every sort of love. So it doesn't matter who comes together and says we're married. It doesn't matter. God's love. So he approves of love, right? And I was, hmm, that's... And so I just asked one question. How do you know God is love? He said, well, I read it in my Bible. I said, okay. Does your Bible also tell you that there are certain loves that God doesn't approve of? Well, you know what? Other religions have Revelation 2, and science tells us, and da-da-da-da-da. And I thought, wow. This is a guy from right in the church. Seminary educated. <laughs> like, he was one of the only believers I knew in high school. Right there he was beside me. Loving Jesus in high school, well, I was just, just clueless. We won't even talk about that. I'm just saying, um, isn't it interesting that this is someone with all the knowledge and the language, but yet going down this path? And for us, that seems easy to navigate, but as it turns out, of the hundred or so people who commented, I was the only one that disagreed. And all of them were using religious language. Um, The flip side, let's go to another part of the spectrum. Um, As many of you know, in October, November, and then on into December and January, there were prophets speaking that about who was going to win the election, right? And um, yeah, he's going to even after it was over. No, he's still going to still Trump's going to win the election, right? And uh, there was a video came out from a a fairly well-known prophet. pastor who we, he and I would, we would probably have some, some significant dis- theological disagreements, but there would be a lot we would agree with him on, and he came out with an apology. And he said, um, I just want to confess and repent um, that I prophesied as a word from God that Donald Trump was going to win this election. And he said, and I'm not going to hedge on this, and he used this term, He said, I've said for 50 years that I would not have what he called rubber prophecy. In other words, I will not stretch the words after the fact to make them fit the situation, right? He said, but this is what I did. I got caught up in the hype. I got caught up in the emotion. And all these famous people were prophesying the outcome of this election. And it got emotional. And I started feeling insecure because these were people that I respected. And it fed off my insecurity. And so I just blurted out there that God had told me this. 
And he said, and let's, let me be even more real for you. Um, I have a tendency to hear what I want to hear. And this is what he said at the end. He said, it hit me that the core of being a prophet is Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus? And what is he offering for you? And what has he done? He is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it just smacked me in the face. What in the world am I doing predicting elections? God didn't call me to that. He called me to reveal Jesus, right? And so it's just interesting to me and not at all shocking that you can draw up a spectrum and there's people speaking for God every which way, right? And they're not just on one team. And so what does he say? Test this. Test this. The word test means critical examination to determine genuineness, to carefully weigh something. He says over in 1 Corinthians 2, we'll just read this and we'll keep moving, but um, we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand the things given to us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths, so those are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. There's our word discernment. Test these things. The spirit person judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And Paul goes on to say that the whole heart of the Spirit being in us is so that we can see Jesus. We'll come back to that in a minute. But that's what the Spirit of God was doing, and that's what the Spirit of God is still doing. And John is saying there is a spirit of the world, and he uses a small s, small s spirit of the world, and the spirit of the world always has an audience. The, the world will always lap this up, right? And you're speaking from God, and it sounds like Bible, and it comes out in different ways. But he says, keep it on Jesus and ask those questions. Now, verse 4 I, I love he does, he uses this term again. Little children, it's like he gets down, he's talking to them, and he says, yeah, and you should, I, I want you to be encouraged just with two final truths here. Um, the first right here is you have overcome, and you are from God. This is, this is beautiful right here. Um, little children, you are from God. Not just this message is from God, Not just I'm giving you what I got from God, but you yourselves are from God. God has made you. God has remade you. Uh, You are a new creation in Christ. And you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You are from God. You've overcome that. Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles. You have trials. You will have difficulty. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I made it through this world believing and proclaiming. He says, you're, you're overcome too by believing in who Jesus really is. This is what he told them back in chapter 2. You yourselves are anointed. You have the Spirit yourselves, right? This isn't just waiting for some anointed person to come and tell you something. You have the Spirit, You remember John's, you can see him recalling, like when Jesus said uh, back in that upper room, listen, it's better if I leave, because if I leave, the Spirit can come, and it won't just be me with you, it will be me in you, right? You have the Spirit of Christ in you. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you have him in you, and Paul says, Christ in you is the hope of glory, and so John isn't writing this letter like really nervous and uptight, like, oh my goodness, I hope they don't believe these false prophets. What are you going to do? And he's just worried all the time. And he's like, no, you all have the Spirit. You've all overcome. You're equipped to discern. You're equipped to test this, right? You're equipped to to see the genuineness. You can ask the right questions. You don't have to worry about this. So, you're from God. 
Look at the second one where he just says, just but listen. Little children, you're from God. You've overcome them. For he was in you is greater than he's in the world. So the spirit in you is greater, more powerful than the spirit of this world, the spirit of this age. So this isn't something you approach with anxiety or fear. It's greater. But secondly, they are from, from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. In other words, they will always have an audience. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So what he's just saying, he says, just keep listening. Keep listening. Keep paying attention. Keep paying attention. There's a great um, verse over in Hebrews 2. Let me flip there real quick and read it to you because it's just a little short thing, but good. Um, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. He says, listen, pay attention, or you will drift away. Right? You don't just wake up one, one morning and make this one giant decision where you ended up over there. It's like steadily drifting. Did you ever go to the beach when you were a kid, right, and your parents were sitting right in front of you when you were in the water playing, and you're out in the waves, and you're out in the waves, and, and you looked up, and somehow, for some strange reason, your parents picked up all their stuff and moved up the beach. It's like, what are they doing? Are they running away from me? No, 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 that's not what happened. You were just playing in the waves and having a good old time, and you did what? You drifted. You drifted. You just kind of started going <laughs> down the beach, right? Pay attention. Listen. Listen. Listen or drift. I've been really, really helped uh, the last couple of weeks. One of the, a guy whose blog I've been reading uh, for many years, his name is Brett McCracken, and, and um, just a really wise, sharp guy. I really appreciated some of his stuff. He just wrote a book. I believe it's called the Wisdom Pyramid. I've been listening to him on these podcasts. And he gets the idea from the Food Pyramid. Did you have to learn the Food Pyramid when you were in school? I think it was, it was probably new. I don't know when the Food Pyramid came out. Maybe some of you older than me. I don't know if there's anyone here older than me. <clears throat> but, that, but, but you may have learned the Food Pyramid when you were a kid, right? And remember you had to learn the food groups? I brought a picture because I just didn't. I didn't pay attention, so I drifted. Um, <laughs> Right? So you've got this pyramid, you've got the food groups, you've got the grain, cereal, rice, pasta group. That's the foundation of the pyramid. Amen. That'll preach, right? And then that right above that, you've got the vegetable group and the fruit group, and they form like combo second layer. And then you go up and you've got the proteins. You've got on one side the milky dairy stuff, and on the other side the meats, right? But then you go to the very top of the pyramid, and you've got this one little triangle, Fats, oils, and sweets. And according to this pyramid here, it says use sparingly, right? And so, you know, you've got this many servings of this and this many servings of this. And if you just want to start a fight on social media, just put the food pyramid up and tell which parts you think we should never eat any of it again as long as we live, right? And just, yeah, I don't want to get into that. But the whole point was that you should have this many servings of this and this many servings of this, and this is what will help you be healthy, right? And it's interesting to me that at the very top, under fats, oils, and sweets, they, they didn't say, don't ever eat this stuff. They said, just yeah, be careful. Eat sparingly. Basically, what they're saying is when you get out the bluebell, get a bowl. Don't just get the spoon in the container, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that, but I heard there are people who do, right? But it's, it's eat sparingly. In other words, this is, right? So, so Brett McCracken came out with this thing called the wisdom pyramid, okay? And he's saying there's a similar process with who you listen to, who you pay attention to, right? So he puts the, the foundation of the pyramid, the Bible, the word of God, it's your daily bread, Right? And then he says, and then there's your church, there's your people you fellowship with, the people you encourage each other with, and the church doctrine, and, and all that. And then on top of that, there's, there's nature, and there's beauty, and there's music, and there's just all the beautiful things God has given us, and we, we take that in. And then he says, and then there's good books, 
lots of good books out there. And then he gets to the very tippy top of the pyramid, and he says, and then there's the internet. <laughs> Use sparingly. <laughs> Get a bowl and measure it, right? <laughs> right? So it's not like never, ever look at the internet. But let's be honest. Our tendency is to turn the pyramid upside down and the foundation. Like, I mean, imagine if somehow somebody invented a counter that was on the wall in your house for all your, everybody in your family, and somehow it added up everybody that was influencing you, everybody you were reading or looking at in the course of a day, in the course of a week, in the course of a month, right? I wonder what our wisdom, our food, our listening, pay attention pyramid would look like when it was all over. Because it's shocking to think the people we listen to, the people we pay attention to. And when we get the pyramid, as my dad would say, upside backwards, when, we, when that happens, we will find ourselves drifting. It happens to me. I'm sure it happens to you. It's like, oh, where did my passion for Jesus go, right? Where did my passion for the Word of God go? So expect, so let me just figure it out then. So expect false teaching. Expect it. <laughs> it came... <laughs> within the generation after Jesus ascended. There was already false teaching. So expect it, um, but know you don't have to be anxious about it. The one in you is greater than the one in the world. And always take it back to Jesus and expect that it could be difficult. Reminding of John 15, if you, were not of the, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you're not of the world, the world hates you. And I want, I want everybody in this room um, to feel comfortable simply saying, okay, but what about Jesus? I mean, listen, there are a lot of topics in this world that I don't know a lot about. I've got this one particular friend who's just really, really brilliant, and he's an unbeliever, and he actually has a name for his worldview, right? Most unbelievers are just unbeliever, but no, 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 no. This guy has a name for his worldview, and he tells me what it is and, and this, and I'm just, I'm just like, well, um, can we talk about Jesus? Yeah, but the God of the Old Testament, he wasn't a very nice guy. Okay, wait, can, can we just talk about Jesus? And, and I feel like First John is telling you, you should be perfectly fine with that. I don't know about that, but what if we start, this is what I tell my friend, what if we started with Jesus and just worked our way out from there? Would you be willing to do that? Because John says the spirit of the world and the spirit of God, that's, that's where you're going to run into stuff, right? Secondly, just know who you are and know whose you are, know where you're from, right? We say that. Where are you from? Wouldn't it be crazy if you just said God? The Bible says I'm from God. We're on a mission from God, right? No, just, just know whose you are. Know who's in you. Be encouraged by that. Be strengthened by that. And don't be afraid. And lastly, just pay attention. Listen, pay attention. Put, your, put the habits in your life, the places in your life, when to, when to put down the internet, when to put down all that other stuff, and having habits built into your life so that you can listen and pay attention to who is speaking to you, the, the Spirit of God, God in the Word, and God with each other, God in good books, God in nature with trees and beauty and song, right? Um, whose you are, pay attention. Don't be afraid. Can I pray for you as we finish up this morning? Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that your Word is good and your Word is true. And we thank you that the Spirit who inspired the Word is the Spirit who has made us new, the Spirit of Christ who's come to take up residence in us. And I want to pray for every single person in this room and for the ones who are, are back in the back down the hall, Lord, um, that you would give each of us just the confidence of knowing whose we are. Lord, it's easy to get caught up in the emotion of the day and the hype of the day and, and to get insecure 
and want to fit in and want to go along and, and we just find ourselves drifting further and further from what is important. I pray that your spirit in us would help us to pay attention, to listen, Lord. Um, I just pray that my brothers and sisters would live in this sort of confidence. And it can easily sound naive or just kind of catchphrasy to say that it's all about Jesus, but it is. It all comes back to him. From him, through him, to him are all things. To him be glory forever, your word tells us. And so God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the room who, who may find themselves right now having drifted, having gotten further and further away from the essential truths Lord, we thank you that when, when we drift, welcoming us back, drawing us back, arms wide open, meal prepared. Thank you for that. Thank you. Lord, we don't, we don't return with shame. We don't return with groveling. We, we t- return with confidence because of Jesus Christ, what you have done on the cross on our behalf that you're the risen one and that you're, you're gentle, you're approachable, you love us. And so for those who are returning back from drifting this morning, we thank you that you are a welcoming, forgiving Savior and Son of God. And I just pray, God, that you would make of us good listeners. And Lord, if... Um, for some of us who are realizing that our pyramid is all out of whack, I pray that you would, if this is a matter of um, Jesus, you talked about um, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. If this is something radical, change that has to come about in our lives, and then so be it. But if these are just little habits that also need to come to play, I pray that you'd give us grace as we establish those. But I pray that, that this would be a place where we are able to encourage one another and admonish one another, Lord. We thank you for the church. What a great gift. Thank you for everyone in this room today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Have a great week. Hope to see you on Easter. Did anybody notice?